Hello, sir. Pleasure. Nice to have you here. Nice to see you again. This um, <laughs> this opera, based on Casanova's memoir, Histoire de ma vie, it, it clocks in, I understand, the memoir at 3,700 pages. Mm -hmm. Not exactly a slim novella. No, it isn't. And you've read it twice. Well, parts of it, probably more than that. But I, I've read it a couple times. Yeah. Why? Why so fascinated with this? Well... I, it wasn't so much uh, because I ever had any fascination for Casanova. It really came about once we started doing this. Mikael Sturminger, who, who wrote the piece and directs it, the script, as is Mikael's uh, want at times, was, came in a bit late. It was unfinished and we worked on it really absolutely through the opening and entire run of the show in Vienna which wasn't long if I, you don't do operas for months and months so we did uh, five shows in Vienna which we got it open and it seemed to go pretty well then we did Sydney which was not going so well and after that I thought we really needed to work on it, so I then went back to the source material a couple of times. Um, two steps back, why didn't Sydney go well? Oh, I think a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, the, when when you do a theater piece, and, and probably even more an opera piece, our two singers who also act in it who originated the their their roles and they they have several different parts in this opera and the Giacomo variations. Florian Bush and, and Sophie Klusman. Florian's one of the great baritones of Europe. He's a spectacularly gifted natural actor. Sophie is a terrific singer, super elegant, uh, very good actress. Once those people were not in it, and they were in it in Sydney, and we put in people who hadn't done it, who didn't have the rehearsal time, and I think, frankly, it probably was underestimated the, the contributions they made, not just as singers, but and not even just as actors, but as performers, which is... A, th a third category and a mm. third quality. Sydney Opera House is a pretty terrible place. Um, it has horrifically bad acoustics. Isn't that the glorious one that we all see in pictures? It's beautiful if yeah. you go by on a motorboat, which is what I would advise <laughs> having a barbecue. Um, <laughs> but inside but the acoustics Going in suck? it, I'd save <laughs> myself that. I, I wouldn't take that time out of the precious little time I have left to me. Um, and I think it was always under-rehearsed uh, and unfinished, I think. Not that I even think it's finished now. I, uh, we, we constantly change and talk about it. But I... Th I think it just wasn't ready, and then that was the year they had the big floods, so our set and costumes didn't get there until late that afternoon, so you couldn't rehearse, and you couldn't rehearse okay. also because Sydney's Symphony could only play three hours a day, so the piece is three was three hours, so et cetera, et cetera. So going back to this Casanova memoir and the near 4,000 pages, I mean, it's it's like Ulysses or something. Would was this then a vocational mission for you, or did you actually become consumed in this memoir? I, it, is, it is a quite involving piece of work. Certainly, he was, wouldn't go into the pantheon of, of, of great writers, Casanova, but he's an awfully good storyteller, and to to whatever extent this memoir is true and, the, and there is great debate about and ha has been for a couple of centuries now. Um, he is a wonderful storyteller and he lived a very rich, interesting life. He did so many things. He was 
a priest, he was a soldier, he was a spy, he was an alchemist, mm. he was a cabalist, he was an occultist, he was a charlatan, he was a Freemason, he was a libertine, he was a writer. He, uh, and, of course, the big obsession of his life, obviously, was women. But he, I think, even was smart about that because he said at some point that he was a victim of his senses. Mm. So... So he wasn't just a ladies' man. He's what you no. called a polymath. Yeah, very much. Not so. unlike you, uh, a Renaissance man. May, maybe in some ways, but I always just do things. Uh, the things I actually study seriously are outside of the realm of what I do. Uh, because I, I've studied many things quite serious in my life, but but forms of artistic expression, I just do it. Hmm. If he was, if Casanova really was such a gifted Renaissance man, why was he always running from debt collectors and crisscrossing Europe with his if he money making schemes? Well, there. Uh, I think neither in Padua or, or Prague or Istanbul or Paris. At that time, there was no uh, Gamblers Anonymous organization, and he had a fantastic gambling problem. Uh, he spent money like crazy. He, he, in fact, if I remember correctly, invented the lotto for the French government and, yeah. and ran it and made a lot of money off it, needless to say, all of which he could lose quite quickly at the gaming tables. So he really had uh, an issue, as they say. When you said a few minutes ago, I'm not even sure if it's ready now in terms of the show mm. that you're doing, that you've been touring around the world. That sounds like a guy who's a perfectionist, who's still well, sweating the details. Uh, is that, would that be true of not, you? Not really sweating, um, but... I think I would know if I felt it was all we could possibly do with this material. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I've ever felt that. And so it's more like having a kind of warning system. And you feel that in other cases, films you make or other things? Most of the time I feel that. I think it's normal. Um, what about when you go back? If you were to look at your work now, do you pick it apart or do you? I'd never look at it. You don't because, look at it. No, especially, I mean, in movies, it's a very different thing because that's not what you did anyway. <laughs> Meaning, if, even if I really like a director and I think he's very good, for the most point, when I see something edited, I think, oh, how funny, I'd never put that with that. <laughs> it's absolutely inconceivable to me. Um, I'd never cut it this way. I'd never order it this way. I'd never... Do it like that. Mm. Theater, of course, is quite different. It's actually you doing it. You you edit it. You pace in moment, it right. in the moment, and so that's very different. And but of course, there is no way to go back to theater. You can't watch yourself in the theater. It's it's ephemeral. It's it's a living organism. You can if your friend bought a mini cam. Or something. <laughs> yeah, but even that, the the you're not there. You know, right, right, right. Well, on that on that note, I mean, the Jacamo variations are. This is your second collaboration with this creative team, uh -huh. right? And you previously starred in the successful musical theater production, The Infernal Comedy. Uh, this is a dark comedy based on a real life serial killer. Is is there more freedom to playing unsettling or complicated characters on stage? versus the screen because of just what you were talking about, being in the moment? Well, I don't know because of what I just don't know of anybody in the history of the world, let alone as a creation of a playwright. And in my case, that means often uh, a quite uh, heavy drinking English playwright. Um, I don't know of a person who's simple. I don't know what it means. Uh, and even if they're simple-minded, which I have played, 
I just ha- I have no experience meeting anyone who is simple. Okay. I think all characters are complicated, and it's the quality of the writing that can render them uh, compellingly complicated or not. Uh, but I think... A stage versus screen is irrelevant? St- uh, stage versus screen, no, it's a different set of criteria, I think. The stage is living, the stage is ephemeral, ephemeral and you had to be there. It's, a, it's the expression people use when... Uh, mm. We try and recount something funny, and people yeah. look at us like, like we're we're disturbed in some way. <laughs> and we say, "I guess you had to be there." Well, with theater, you do, and with movies, you don't. Uh, that movie, a movie performance, is the end result, the product of probably the most heavily manipulated of the. I don't know, art forms, but forms of artistic expression. And you have precious little to do with that at the end. You know, I've done films where I go, gosh, I thought this was going to be great. Um, Who scored this? Are they of sound mind? (laughs) Um, Who edited this? What? And many times, even if it's people I think are terrific, even the better films I've done, for the most part, I would look at them and go, oh, that's what you wanted to do? Does a film come to mind? Uh, most of them. I I felt when I saw it, well, if I would have known that's what you wanted to do, <laughs> we could have done that so easily. That's a difficult place, Cage, to put yourself in, isn't it? No, you know, to me, it's just, it's literally how... It, the it's, way you see it. It's really the way I see it. Um, because see, the how I would describe it is is film is like a line drawing. Mm. Um, I will start a film in Edmonton in a few days. It is a lovely script, and I will go in every day and I'll do my best line drawing. But I never get to revisit that. I'll never look at that scene again. I will never be able to uh, investigate if that is the best way to do that scene. So film is a a medium merciless on writers uh, because I can do a play six months or a year and still be not tinkering, overhauling. Mm. Uh, That to me is completely normal. It's more like being a painter. But painters go in, if it's it's Lucian Freud or Bacon or Rembrandt, it's it's not a one-day activity. Yeah. Uh, Even if it's just a girl with an earring, it's it's a... Well, you can reshoot in films, right? It's so cost-prohibitive. And you reshoot because you have story problems. Mm. You rarely reshoot because you say, you know, uh, I like the film, uh, I like the film Wolfgang, it's terrific. But now I realize the character is left handed. So if you don't mind reshooting the whole $60 million film, <laughs> for me to fulfill my artistic expression, (laughs) that would be terribly kind and I'll be forever grateful. But in fact, films don't work that way. You may get one day or two days or Woody Allen may get five days. But no, you never, ever revisit it. Back to this, it's play. I mean, it's not surprising that you're doing a play. It's not, or an opera, even uh, then Casanova doesn't seem... Uh, surprising associated with John Malkovich either, that your singing comes as a surprise to some people. How does it feel to be singing in a show? Well, I like it. I I don't sing tons. I I, I 
singing and playing guitar was how I made money in college. And before that, I was in madrigals or chorus or I've sung since I, I was tiny. But I didn't sing for many, many years. And that, that was several hundred thousand packets of cigarettes ago. And I certainly <laughs> never sang opera. But I love doing it and love hearing the orchestra every night and working with the singers. For for Ingeborg Adap Kunaite and I, who, who plays opposite me, it, for us it's a little bit difficult because we have to do every show and the singers alternate because they generally wouldn't do more than three shows in a row. Um, so the last time we didn't do this play every day was May 28th. Mm. Um, and that puts a little strain in plus because there are a number of, of pieces where I'm meant to be speaking over a rather energetic 32-piece Baroque orchestra, which is some degree of vocal stress. Uh, do you get intimidated? <clears throat> I mean, do you get intimidated by anything in terms of performance? No, not on stage. Uh, what, what about with singing now? No. Uh, if I had, I had one show for no reason, I have no idea why, where I lost my voice completely in, in Santander in Spain. I wasn't, hadn't even been smoking for a year. Just, there's a lot of... There was a lot of kind of screaming over the orchestra, mm. and that can take a big toll. But I wasn't intimidated. I was uh, furious. But <laughs> the singing part is is not a problem. Do, very quickly, when you were playing the guitar and singing in college, what would what were you doing? Neil Young tunes? What was it? Yeah, well, mostly folk or folk rock. You know. Uh, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, uh, all, all of the usual suspects. All know. the Canadians, I appreciate uh, uh, that. Gordon Lightfoot. Well done. In John point Mitchell. of fact. <laughs> uh, back to Casanova. This isn't your first time playing a seducer, of course. Your, your turn as Valmont in uh, the 1988 film uh, version of Dangerous Liaisons made you, effectively made you a global star. Has playing these characters, John, given you in any insight into the art of seduction? No, I wouldn't say that. It's Valmont gives you a lot of insight into emotional cruelty and cowardice. And of course, he was oddly enough. I just directed it in Paris last year with yes. a young French cast and with an actor who's 40,000 times better than I, I would ever have dreamt of being. Um, and fusing the 18th century with the modern day, I understand. Yeah, I did it in a... Oh, to me, it made perfect sense, but I did it almost in a rehearsal setting without set, with kind of rehearsal costumes and all actors on stage the entire play. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very, very fond of this production and that group of actors. But I think the thing is, once you do, once you're kind of set in people's minds a certain way, um, there are people who see you as if you bore a resemblance to that character, which I, I certainly do not. Uh, I The only character I could think of that I was ever even a little bit like was Lenny in Of Mice and Men. Mm -hmm. But there are people who see you as... Uh, somebody told me today, am I aware of my image? And I said, what, what image is that? Um, that you're so intense and people are afraid of you. And I said, you know, not anybody who knows me. I mean, the, their images. It's a and powerful if you have disposition the, to carry, to yeah. invoke fear in others. Yeah. Own and it. If you, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I understand it, but it, what I'm trying to say is that if, if you played Valmont, you're seen sure. as Valmont. 
if if you played this guy, you're seen as that kind of guy. Um, and you know that there are um, reviews of this show. There are people talking about it who say it's no surprise that John Malkovich plays the libertine or the Lothario. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, I. It's not a surprise to the extent that I played Valmont, I played Lord Rochester, I played now Casanova, and I was offered Saad. Um, It's a big surprise to me why I was asked to do it. That, That remains a mystery to me, but we choose from that amongst which we've been chosen for. And it's a mystery to me why people would choose me to do uh, Color Me Kubrick or The Great Buck Howard or to play Klimt or to do In the Line of Fire. Really? I don't know why. Yeah, because it's not me. But you know you're a great actor. I, I know that in the right situation, given a sufficiently profound, evocative material that I can do that job well. Yes, I know that. More on stage than in movies, maybe, because movies were a sort of learned... It's like I was a pianist, and then somebody said, okay, well, anyway, shut up about that and play the saxophone and just blow on it and be quiet. Um, It's more like play the synth. Okay. Right. It's or it's a very it's a st- you're still on the keyboard. Yeah. But you're it's a different version. It's a different thing. And but I'll always even if I do a play for a year or two years, I'm always looking to to improve it in whatever possible way I can. Sometimes, as I said to to Mikel, our director today, we're talking about if we want to go ahead with this in the future. It's been two and a half years once we've we've finished here in Toronto, and a few days finished for this year. We do a film of it in in the summer, and they were asking me about next year, and I said, "Well, the thing I don't know is has this run its course, or is there a way forward?" If there is, I don't know what it is. Somebody will have to tell me what it is, you know, and that's what a director's for. But but most things in this process, I think, are never ending. The the, the great cinematographer, uh, Christopher Doyle, was here yesterday, and um, he says when somebody asks me what, what my best film is, he says the next one. Yeah, sure. That resonates for you. Yeah. Uh, It never works out for me, but it (laughs) resonates for me. Uh, Yeah, because I'm not someone... I'm not very reflective about what I've done in the past. I did it. I did normally my best at that time. Uh and given whatever circumstances present in themselves. But I only look forward. Mm. Uh, I never look back. I don't have a lot of time with you here. Let me just try a couple more questions yeah. on you before we go. Um, the fusion of styles. I'm talking about the fusion of danger, dangerous liaisons, the 18th century today. The fusion of styles is a theme in your in your work, in your roles. You make deeply personal theater. You make films like The Dancer up, Upstairs. And then you're this familiar face in mainstream Hollywood movies. Uh, do you see those things? I'm thinking of Con Air or Red. Do you, mm-hmm. do you see those as two different realms or is artistic satisfaction versus commercial success a false dichotomy? I think it's a false dichotomy. Uh, I think as an actor, I do... Uh, I do good work in both those films. Um, I approach them with the same seriousness that I have approached doing three or four Portuguese art films uh, 
or doing a piece of theater or, or doing Saturday Night Live. It's all work. You, you try to be good. You try to uh, amuse people or touch people or compel people. Um, and I think it is a false dichotomy. I've terrifically enjoyed doing some big Hollywood films and I've been absolutely miserable doing some art films because uh, I'm not really a genre person. Mm. And for me, my, you know, Peter Pan is one of my favorite plays. Mm. Um, so I don't mind that. Have you ever right? phoned it in? Honestly? Yeah, but not, you know, you if you get to a set and you already have doubts about the material and you speak with the powers that be about the material and say, you know, could we just make, you know, in other words, do you mind if I rewrite this? Um, and they like it like that. And their idea of directing is kind of, could you make a happy face? Could you make an angry face? Could you shout? Could you wave your sword? I'm not very good <laughs> at, um, at giving them fruitful things with that kind of direction, but I do do my best. But that is kind of phoned in, meaning... It's nothing you could have possibly ever thought of, but it's what they want. And, and you know, it can't be forgotten, especially in movies. You're, you're essentially a character in someone else's dream. Oh, it's not your dream. It's how do they like it? How do they want it? John, it's such a pleasure to have you here. The 20, My pleasure. 2013. Seems like a busy year for you. I'm looking at this list. You're, you're doing the stage work. You have the movies. You, Warm Bodies was released in February. You have two more movies to come, Red 2 and uh, Diego Lunes Chavez. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about shooting in Edmonton. You give the impression of having a a lively, varied, creative life. Are you, are you in a satisfied period? Yeah, very much so. But I always have been... I was so lazy, I think, when I was young, because really all I did was act in plays or direct plays. Or maybe I just had, you know, I'm a kid from a little small town in Illinois, and maybe that was enough to occupy my mind, but it wouldn't be anymore. And I seem to work more and more as the years pass, and the vast majority of them are things not to make a living but because they interest me and working on them interests me. Great to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you for this. Pleasure. My pleasure.